Um, I do want to say a few things um, just to introduce and recognize the people who have made this conference possible. So I want you to know and be able to see um, all the people and if you have questions throughout the day. So um, I'm going to start. I'm going to start by calling various people um, into both individuals and groups. I'd like you just to briefly stand um, and be acknowledged. But please, let's. We don't need to have applause. Just to, I, I just want people to be stand and acknowledged so that we can see you. Um, those are all the people who have worked on this conference. So first of all, I just want to acknowledge the conference planning team. Um, and that's my comrade in arms, Megan Sullivan. Megan, can you stand up? Okay, there's Megan. Um, Talia Havivi, is Talia here in the room? These are the, the, this is the Mass Energize team. Here's Talia back here. Talia, you wave. Okay. And then somebody who's not here, who worked very, very hard, is our dedicated ad administrative assistant, Joe Jagger. Now, Joe is home with a brand new baby. Um, and Joe was in, I, 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 um, I was doing her payroll, just her, pay, you know, her weekly payroll, and I saw that Joe, the night before she was going to the hospital to give birth, was, had put three hours in stuffing name tags. So that's how dedicated Joe is. And her husband, so she, she, she couldn't be here, she sent her husband, who's here in her place. So a big thank you to Joe and, um, and, and Adam, who's here as well. Okay, so moving on quickly, I also want to introduce the Mass Energize board. Um, and I just ask, ask the board members just to quickly stand as I call your name. So Ellen Tone, who's our board chair, Brad Nicholson, Stephen Bright, um, and then our core team, Amy Pualka. Amy here? Okay. And, Ta and then and Talia is also part of the core team. So thank you. Okay, then I also want to acknowledge all the volunteers who've put in a lot of time already this morning and are going to be putting into more time. Could the volunteers just stand up? If you're volunteering today, just stand up. Many people are wearing Mass Energize t-shirts. Here's our, our indom indomitable Andrew Breitup. Other volunteers, thank you to the volunteers. And now the presenters, the presenters and the panelists, all of you have taken time out of your day, out of your week to come. Just stand up, just stand up. All of the, everybody who's presenting, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I also want to acknowledge and recognize all those of you who in the registration process donated to our Environmental Justice Scholarship Fund. You helped make a more diverse and a more inclusive conference. So maybe just raise your hand if you, if you made a donation to the scholarship fund. Thank you all, thank you all very much. Okay, and then finally, all of you who have taken time to come and be here today. I know it's, we have busy lives, there's lots of work to do, um, and I hope that this conference is all that you hope it to be. Okay, now I wanna also quickly acknowledge our sponsors. We've had some, we have very generous sponsors who are here, and I'm gonna encourage you to meet with them, talk to them throughout the day. But first of all, just our, 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 our platinum sponsors, Rare, and maybe the folks from Rare can maybe just raise your hand. Stand up. But yeah, just stand up briefly. The folks from Rare. Okay, thank you. The sponsors from Mass Save, which includes Berkshire Gas, Cape Light Compact, Eversource, Liberty, National Grid, and Unitel. Great. Thank you. Um, our gold sponsor, CMRK. Thank you. Mass, Mass Power Choice, a subsidiary of Peregrine Energy. Thank you. And Revision Energy. So the, okay, there's the Revision folks. Thank you, Revision. Great. Our silver sponsors, GW and Wade. Not sure if they're here. Um, and then our bronze sponsors, Green Vest. Thank you. Sunwealth, I don't think Sunwealth's here yet. Oh no, Sunwealth's there, great. Just arriving, good. Um, and the Village Bank, great, thank you. And as I said, they're here throughout the day. They have very valuable services to offer, so please do take some time to go chat with the sponsors. Okay, and so without further ado, I want to introduce another friend of mine, Frank Lowenstein. Frank is the leader of the Climate Culture, uh, the RARES Climate Culture Program here in Boston, and it is really thanks to RARE that the, with their early support and early investment in us, Mass Energize, that really kicked this conference idea off. So we had the idea, we wanted to do it, we weren't sure how we were gonna pull it off, 
And Rare was our early investor. So I just want to say thank you to Rare, and I'm going to pass the podium to Frank. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks to all of you for being here. What would a conference be without people in it? Um, I'm not going to tell you much about Rare right now. We're a 50-year-old uh, uh, environmental organization that focuses on behavior change and helping communities to make changes they want to make. But please uh, track me down later at our display over here, or my two colleagues who are here, Jasmine Barnwell and Persia McGurry. Raise your hands, guys. Um, and we'll be happy to tell you more about us. But right now, I want to talk about climate action, right? So I want to ask all of you to stir yourselves for a minute and raise your hands if you think that climate action is vital. OK, now keep your hands up. I want those of you who think that we are fully successful today to keep your hands up and everybody else put your hands down. OK, so that's the problem, right? None of us feel like we're being fully successful yet. So what's holding us back? Well, there's a number of external factors, right? There's fossil fuel companies and their money. There's the distrust that has taken over our polity and our society today. There's depression and anxiety. And perhaps those of us who most acutely feel the future impact of the climate crisis might be most susceptible to those. And there's disunity in our ranks. We're not sure entirely what to do. So what's the path forward? Well, um, I want to encourage us to build the constituency. Don't try even to convince those folks who are committed to their disbelief. Flow around them. Be like sea level rise. Take over the easy paths. Flow, engage those who are ready to hear the message until the uh, islands of disbelief are surrounded by a sea of social norms in favor of climate action and their behavior, even those who are committed to disbelief, as I put it, um, will be constrained by those new social norms. So my call to action for all of you for today, as you're standing here, sitting here, doing whatever, attending these sessions, is to, um, is to look across town lines, across racial and class lines, and to seek unity. What is it that we can do together? Let's learn from corporate success. Nike doesn't have just do it as a slogan in one part of the organization and something else, even if it was appropriate, like climb high for some other part. They have a unified message. We need that unified message to the extent that we can find it. And we need to recognize that we need to have an inclusive effort that reaches as many people as possible. So we need to recognize that climate justice, climate action needs to be intersectional with racial and social justice. Um, and uh, I encourage us all to think about that as we choose the actions. Mass Energize has done an amazing job of assembling uh, the speakers and the panels that are going to help you with that. So go forth and uh, learn from each other, seek commonality and seek that sea level rise to constrain the islands of disbelief. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Frank. The tide is rising and so are we. Okay, so now we I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing our plenary speaker, Dr. Sarah Das. Dr. Sarah Das is a scientist and educator at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution the world's leading independent nonprofit organization dedicated to ocean research, exploration, and education. She is also an ambassador with Science Moms, an organization of nonpartisan mothers who work in climate science and who are concerned about the future of their kids and all kids and the future that they will face. In her scientific career, Sarah has led over 20 research expeditions to Greenland and Antarctica, and her work has provided new insight into how climate change is impacting our polar regions and why that matters for the rest of our planet. I think that's kind of self-evident, but thank you to Sarah for demonstrating that to us clearly. After close to three decades bearing witness 
to the rapidly melting polar ice sheets. Much of our focus now is, is, is on developing science-based solutions to improve coastal community resilience to rising seas, training the next generation of client, science, climate scientists, and sharing the importance of understanding and acting on climate change with policymakers and the public. Dr. Das is also a member of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts new Climate Science Advisory Panel advising the Massachusetts Office of Climate Science within the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs to inform the state's climate adaptation and resilience strategy. Dr. Sarah Das. Hello, can you guys hear me okay? Hi, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to Megan and Nathan and the rest of the organizers. Um, and I think this is my advancer. I'm gonna give this a try. Um, so as uh, in the introduction, um, sort of here wearing two hats, maybe three hats. Um, I am a scientist at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution um, where I've worked for over 20 years uh, on the scientific faculty there. I um, also teach there uh, and work in a, a wide variety of programs at the Oceanographic. Um, and I'm also an ambassador with Science Moms and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that program and um, connect you with some of the amazing resources that that program also provides. Um, also, you know, as we all are part of a community, um, the photograph in the background of my title slide here is um, my hometown of Scituate, Massachusetts. I live on the South Shore, Massachusetts with my family. Um, and this is from a storm just a few years ago. Um, one of the, uh, you know, real precious areas, um, coastal areas of Massachusetts that is uh, increasingly at risk due to climate change and motivating a lot of the work that I'm doing now. I'm going to start this presentation, uh, hopefully this will play, with a little movie. Um, a lot of our work with Science Moms um, has to do with elevating voices and information through kind of more traditional um, marketing and messaging campaigns. Um, this is a really powerful film that the group has put together. It's not my voice in the background, but so much of this resonates with me. Um, so I hope it will it'll help sort of all focus our attention. I know you all know why you're here today, but sometimes uh, it's, it's good to have a little bit more um, emotional connection. So we'll see if we can get this to go. Do I push that again? As a scientist, I know by the time she takes her first breath, nine billion more tons of carbon pollution will be in the air. When she takes her first steps, wildfires will have burned millions more acres she could have explored. The day she gets her first pet, there are thousands of newly extinct species she'll never meet. The night she forgets to call, the night of her first heartbreak, her future home floods for the first of many times. By the time a child born today goes to college, it may be too late to leave them the world we promised. Our window to act on climate change is like watching them grow up. We blink and we miss it. So later is too late. One of the taglines, um, go to the next slide, uh, and sort of one of the messages that we hope to get across um, through our campaign work with Science Moms. And, and really, part of my motivation for spending a lot of my energy and attention, um, what I call this decisive decade, to increase action, to increase awareness, and really to lay out in stark terms uh, through what we call the front door, you know, enough of these side doors kind of coming in with subtle messages, through the front door, everything that is at stake, all the choices that we need to make now, and really how, you know, as Nathan said, so importantly, we need to come together. We are coming together. Here we are um, coming together as community to make the changes that are needed to influence um, the powers that be and the leaders to uh, get us back on the right track. Um, so Science Moms is really an incredible organization I've been privileged to be part of for just a couple of years. 
Um, now it is this nonpartisan group. Um, I could spend an hour talking about what we do. I could spend an hour talking about any one of these slides, but you'd then be here for you know, two solid days just listening to me and nobody wants that. So I just want to direct you to the website. There's a tremendous amount of resources, sciencemoms.com to provide you and, and just acknowledge my fellow science moms. This is a community that's valuable to me as a scientist and a mom and someone who's very passionate about sharing this information. So I'm just going to start with a couple of pictures of my kids. So in that little clip, you, you sort of got that context for a child going from a newborn all the way off to college and how things are changing in the blink of an eye. I feel that acutely. Um, on, I have two daughters. They're both teenagers now. Uh, my older daughter is headed off to college um, next fall. And so I do feel like that time, you know, that almost 20 years has gone by in the blink of an eye. Um, my kids, everyone's kids, the future for the world's kids really uh, motivates me and drives a lot of the work that I'm doing now. Um, I also like to show a picture of one of our fav family's favorite activities, which is skiing. If you guys live in New England, you know it can be very long and dark and cold and gloomy, and skiing is a way as a family we have really found to get out and enjoy the great outdoors together, get some exercise, um, keep our spirits up. But we've also noticed, as any of you here that are fans of winter sports have noticed in New England, that changes over recent decades. Right, winters are getting warmer in New England in the Northeast. Winter is the most rapidly warming season that we're facing. We used to be able to count on snowfall, uh, especially a little bit north of here, probably here, lakes freezing over, all sorts of things that are important for recreation, but also the economies, um, ecosystems. This is all changing right now in the face of us. We are seeing winters like we've never seen before. I wonder, when my kids are raising their kids, hopefully in New England, because I don't want them to go too far, will they be able to enjoy skiing with their families? Will they be able to have these same experiences? Or will they be facing winters that are nothing like what I consider a New England winter? So this is, these are the things we are facing and trying to save and so important to us. I clearly really like the cold, ice and snow. Um, so as Nathan said, in my work, I've spent over 20 years um, doing fundamental primary research in the polar regions. Again, I could give a whole lecture just on this. If you're interested in that, reach out later. So I'm not gonna focus too much here on those particular aspects of my work. Um, but I think you know, one of the things that gives me some credibility and, and perhaps allows me to connect the big picture climate problems that we're facing has to do with the um, primary work that I've been able to do by traveling to places like Greenland and Antarctica and carrying out the research to help us understand how these enormous and complex and far away big ice sheets have been changing, are changing today in response to the warming that we're experiencing. So we've been able to demonstrate through um, putting out sensitive geophysical instruments how much more quickly places like Greenland, the ice moves in the summertime as meltwater increases, as summer warming increases, the Arctic in fact, is warming four times faster than the global average. Um, and that is leading to longer and warmer summers and much more rapid loss of ice. So just over the course of my career, the increase in the loss of ice from Greenland has increased sevenfold. I also do work in Antarctica. We do things like collect ice cores and get a longer term context for climate change. And we're also able to put the current change in the Antarctic within this longer term perspective. Um, and the Antarctic is, is starting to catch up to Greenland in terms of ice loss. Um, and both of these enormous ice sheets with feel far away and very complicated um, are sort of awakening from this long, long slumber and starting to slough off, shed off ice into the ocean, which of course, as I'll come back to, um, affects us acutely here in Massachusetts as well as around the world um, when it comes to things like sea level rise. Okay, so why are we here today? What is, what is really motivating all of us to want to spend, a, sure, you are all very busy, take time out of your busy schedules um, and your whatever else your careers are or your community commitments are or your family commitments are, spend time here today learning from each other, getting best practices and things like that. Um, it is the fact that we are living on a transformed planet already and what is to come is frankly alarming. So 2023, 
um, has now been documented as the warmest year to date on record. And as you can see in this nice visualization um, that Berkeley Earth has created of um, the temperature anomaly, so that's the warming over the sort of average between um, the 20th century average, a uh, mid-century average. Um, what's really illustrated here is that there is almost no place on the planet that is not experiencing um, these warm extremes. And so as the colors go from white to dark red, you see the intensity of that anomaly in um, degrees centigrade. And you can see in particular, as I mentioned in the Arctic and also the Northern hemisphere overall, um, warming much faster than the rest of the planet. And also it's warming across land and sea. So this is not a problem that is really specific to land masses. The ocean is also experiencing an enormous amount of warming over this period of time. I suspect most of us here already understand why we have global warming. Well, can I just have a show of hands? People have a pretty good sense, rough sense. Okay, good. All right, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, Megan assured me that I was speaking to an audience that was well informed. <laughs> but I still think that there is some important context. And um, this is a figure that in, in sort of, I don't want to say a cartoon sense because these are real data, but purposefully there's, there's no real long time scale on here. This is about 2000 years. The colors, focus just on the colors um, at first. This is um, sort of cooler temperatures over those 2000 years. Um, and then this rapid spike in red right towards the present. You see the we are here up at the top. And what you see through this kind of illustration is that over a really long period of time, again, thousands of years, the earth has been in a fairly stable and relatively cool state. And it's really just in the last uh, couple of hundred years, in particular the last hundred years, that these temperature anomalies have shot up. And we're now experiencing over one degree centigrade warming over that 2000 year average. The black line are carbon dioxide levels. So the black line is not tracing the color curve there. These are two independent measurements, but of course they're not independent, right? Because we know that it's greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere that are leading to these temperature anomalies. And why do we have these elevated levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? So we have undergone this energy revolution, right? Just since the mid 19th century, people have figured out how to burn all sorts of fossil fuels, mostly starting from a well-intentioned place, right? This is progress. This has allowed us to do so many things, increase um, you know, lifespans have doubled, uh, energy production, food production, health has improved. So there's a lot of good things that have come um, over the last 150 years. But this, in some ways, um, has had originally kind of the unintended consequences of also leading to these increases in atmospheric gases. The problem is that even once we figured out what was happening with the burning of fossil fuels, increases of things like CO2 and methane in the atmosphere, the warming that was causing and the challenges that was being, were being created, um, is we started to sort of become used to this way of doing things. And that's why what we're really facing is kind of a transformation in how do we adapt and adjust our entire world, our entire energy system, our entire way of living, our entire way of being comfortable around the world. Um, to, to a new way of thinking. And that's an enormous challenge. And this is something that we all need, as was mentioned, hands on deck to deal with this. We're past the point of really being able to say that we don't know enough or we need to study more. Um, but I also think it's useful to point out the context for this scale of change, right? So it seems like a very long time, the 1860s seems like an impossibly long time ago, right? But then I think to myself, so my grandparents' grandparents were born in the 1860s. I knew my grandparents very well. They could talk about their grandparents. That doesn't feel like an impossibly long time ago to me. And in fact, my house that I live in was built in 1858. It's still doing pretty well, right? So this is not an impossibly long time ago. So in some ways, it's been just this very short blip in human history, a few generations, a few, you know, 
variations in, in house construction style, that we've completely transformed our energy system and we can do it again and we can do it faster because we have so much more innovation available to, meet, to us now, so much more will, um, so many more resources. And we have this motivation to act because we need the planet to be sustainable and to protect the things that are important to us going forward. I've indicated a couple other things on this just to give you a sense for how the generations march through time. And you can probably all find your own family stories in here. So, you know, as we transitioned uh, from uh, coal towards oil um, as an increasing uh, uh, energy source around the time that my parents and grandparents were born. Um, when I was born, but don't blame me, we st started to tap more into things like natural gas. Um, my kids were born, we're using everything now, right? So one of the things that does kind of jump out at you in a figure like this is that when one thing comes online, we're not really reducing the other. And as I'll circle back to later on in the talk, this is an increasing challenge as well as we're bringing so many new renewable energy sources online. Is in some ways, we're still just increasing the amount of energy that we need and rely on. So we really also need to figure out how to make do with less energy overall. Um, this is the same time scale as the last figure, so 1860s to the present, um, global average temperature. Um, this is similar to that map view that I showed, but now we're looking at it through time. So one of the things that I want to highlight here is the last dot far on the right, which is the global average temperature in 2023, which as I pointed out is the highest on record, and you can see that very clearly here. It's also approaching this number that some of you may have heard of in sort of climate aspiration goals or the news, which is one and a half degrees centigrade. Does that number mean anything to people? One and a half degrees, that's something? Okay, yeah, you guys are well informed. <laughs> so one and a half degrees is part of this Paris Agreement, the UN Climate Agreement, sort of this target goal of trying to keep global average temperatures within one and a half degrees warming over pre-industrial averages. Um, and I think it's, it's sometimes useful to point out that there's slightly different time context there. We may have come close to that in 2023, but as you can see also illustrated here, you know, each year is not necessarily higher than the next. There's this interannual variability that's very important, but the, the march, the overall average trend is of course increasing high. But what this one and a half degree year does give us is perhaps a preview in some ways of this newer, hotter world that is to come. I'm going to talk a couple times in this um, presentation about numbers like one and a half degrees or two degrees or three degrees. And to many people, these feel like small differences. What's a half a degree, right, anyway? But it actually has enormous impact when you think about what it means to various pieces of the climate system. For example, the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets that I study are considered, while melting, to be fairly stable with one and a half degrees warming. Not so with two degrees, absolutely not with two and a half or three degrees warming. These ice sheets will become unstable and start to, not tomorrow, not even in a hundred years, irreversibly melt and fall apart. Coral reefs, similarly around the world, they'll probably be able to recover things like marine, in marine heat waves if we can keep global average targets towards one and a half degrees. That's one of the reasons why this is a goal of the Paris Agreements. Probably not at two degrees. Similar, many other examples, the Amazon rainforest, Arctic permafrost. This is why as scientists, we keep coming back to numbers like this. This is a little bit of a complicated um, figure, but I'm gonna walk you through it um, just to give you a sense of these, these targets and what it is that we're really here working towards. And again, why I feel like this is such a crucial and important decade for us to figure things out and put our planet on the right track. Um, so we've now jumped from this kind of like looking backwards pre-industrial 1860 to 2020 period. And now on this um, x-axis, we're looking at, you know, 1992, 2000, so recent um, decades towards the future, towards 2100. And if you look at the different color sort of cones that are coming off of that black line, what they're illustrating is climate temperature ranges, four degrees in the pink up at the top, 
two and a half or so to three degrees in orange, and then down at that bottom, that one and a half at two degrees, under various future CO2 emission scenarios. So that y-axis there is the um, annual global greenhouse gas emissions going into the future. And when we talk about the future is not yet written and why this is such an important time for us to act and make changes, um, it is because of the spread in that future possibility. These future temperature targets, do we want stable ice sheets? Do we want coral reefs? And as I'll get to, what does that actually mean for the people in the communities, those sorts of changes? Um, we need to bend that curve of emissions downward and we need to do it right now. We are on this path towards the lower end of that pink curve, that um, high climate uh, target, um, what we call these no climate policies. And every decision we make, every leader we elect, every change we make from our own house to our um, sort of global goals is going to have a piece of to play in which of these curves we end up on. So what's in a few degrees? I'm trained as an earth scientist. And what that gives me is a little bit of a unique perspective on what a few degrees globally matters um, in the context of our planetary change. Where we're standing today, so about 20,000 years ago, during the last glacial maximum, we were under over a mile of thick polar ice that covered all of New England, all the way down to about um, Long Island. The global average temperatures during that time of, of um, last glacial maximum were only about five degrees cooler than they are today. So while five may not seem like a big difference, you go outside one day to the other, you know, when you're talking about global averages sustained over centuries for thousands of years, that is the difference between, you know, this part of Boston being covered under a continental scale ice sheet that's completely gone now versus not. As we emerged from that ice age and the planet warmed, it did so much more slowly than the temperature rise that we're facing today. So the planet warmed at about one and a half degrees centigrade over a thousand years. We've warmed, as I showed in the prior slide, about one and a half degrees just over the last almost hundred years. So this also makes it much more challenging for our coastlines, our communities, ecosystems, everything that we count on, rely on and care about to adapt. We can also look even farther in the geologic past to worlds perhaps similar to what we might be headed towards. Um, geologists like to focus on an era, an era of time called the mid-Pliocene. Have any of you here heard about the mid-Pliocene warm period? Let's see how many real climate geeks. All right, a few, all right, good. Um, it's a pretty cool era. It's considered a useful geologic analog for understanding what the planet may look like in the future. This was around three million years ago atmospheric carbon dioxide levels were similar to what they are today. Now it takes a while for the Earth to evolve towards these states. Temperatures were about two and a half to four degrees warmer. So remember those colored cones that we talked about. Do we want to be on that one and a half to two, two degree lower curve? We need to really change everything about how we think about energy systems this decade. Or do we want to be on these higher curves, more similar to the mid Pliocene? And I would argue the former. So in that middle map, what I want to point out to you is two lines. These lines are really illustrating what a coastline is. It's not a fixed thing, right? So the ocean changes over time as the big ice sheets, the things that I study grow and shrink over geologic time. And between the last ice age, this colder period that I mentioned, and this mid Pliocene, if you were to map out where the coastline of the eastern seaboard of the US is, it would be um, hundreds of kilometers apart. So as these large ice sheets expanded during a few degrees cooler period, the ocean was hundreds of kilometers away from here, far off the coast. All that ocean locked up on land. During a period like the mid Pliocene where we had very little polar ice, the shoreline here and all up and down the eastern seaboard was over 100 kilometers inland of where it is now. And geologists have actually been able to go out and they can map these scarp environments. They can map out where this prior mid Pliocene coastline is and show very accurately how much higher sea levels were then, which we think were 10 to 20 meters higher than today. I'm gonna to skip this one, it's a little bit of a joke. <laughs> 
Um, I just in the interest of time. Okay, so we're talking about climate, sort of big picture, why we have warming, how might that inform us about what we need to do in the future. But really what it also comes down to all these climate changes is how does it impact us as people and communities as the built environment? So another thing that's been happening um, is that the number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters have been increasing um, every year uh, across the United States. And this is a nice graphic that Noah, um, not nice and like yay, but uh, <laughs> puts out um, that really drives home this point that the US is facing more and more of these, what they call these billion dollar weather disasters. So this is just for 2023, there were close to 30 separate billion dollar disasters across the United States and um, very few parts of the country were immune to this. We can also think about how many of these we've had since we started keeping track. This has been somewhat inflation adjusted, but a sort of staggering sum to me is since 1980, we have faced over two and a half trillion dollars of weather and climate disaster events across the United States. And Massachusetts similarly has faced many of these. So if you go onto the NOAA page where you can access these resources, you can do a drop down by, by region, by state, perhaps even by county. And you can start to pull out and start to dig in a bit to the more of the kind of state and local if effects, the kinds of things that are facing a state like Massachusetts. And these will be no surprise to you, but these are climate and weather related events that impact us and our communities. We have droughts, cyclones, flooding, wildfire, freezes, winter storms, um, et cetera. Okay, so climate change is global. We've talked about these sort of global scale temperature increases across all land, across all ocean, no place is really immune. But again, these effects are felt locally. So some of the top climate concerns for Massachusetts, some of these vary based on where you're located. Where we're sitting here today, probably no one's that that concerned about things like sea level rise. The town that I live in is illustrated by that cover shot. You know, we are facing flooding events and sea level rise challenges every day in our town. Um, sea level rise is one of the top concerns for Massachusetts. There's over 70 coastal towns and cities in Massachusetts. And in fact, um, the state's uh, coastal zone management um, organization, I just heard a figure they put out at a workshop a couple weeks ago uh, saying that in the um, next 50 years, they expect another 20 cities and towns to enter that coastal zone because coastal rivers that feed up into our towns and communities are going to be reaching um, tidal ranges that never have been seen before. So we're gonna be growing the number of communities that are affected by coastal effects. Um, that was sort of a new way of thinking about things for me. We have rising ocean temperatures. So that impacts, um, you know, fisheries, uh, which is an important part of our economy, toxic algae blooms, so our own health, and it also feeds into the energy systems that lead to heavier rainfall and storm systems. We have these increased precipitation events occurring. I think many of you are familiar with these enormously intense rainstorms that we've been seeing. Um, and in fact, that is uh, something that the Northeastern US has been seeing increase um, faster than many other parts of the country as well. Um, the droughts are becoming more intense because summer temperatures are warmer. And while we haven't had a lot of tropical storms hit our region, tropical storms in general are intensifying. Um, and there will be a time when they come back around. I'm not gonna dig into this at all as well, but I just wanna direct you towards um, the state has done a remarkable job and is really putting a lot of energy and attention towards creating uh, resilient future, resilient mass planning, there's coastal resilience planning. Um, so direct you to these resources. Um, and they've really identified and are, are consistently working towards helping meet these um, priority impact sectors. Uh, but I just, you know, some of the things for me, just reviewing this also helped connect to me some of these higher level science problems that we're facing in ways that I never really even thought about. So I'll just use an example um, under something like, uh, you know, the human impacts, emergency services response. Right. So here's something where perhaps because of an extreme coastal storm event or flooding event, first responders can't get to communities in need or people that are having a health emergency can't get to a hospital or, you know, heaven forbid, a hospital is inundated and loses its power system. So there's so many interconnected uh, ways that everything is being impacted. So there's, you know, you can talk about 
these individual impacts and events, but they are really very interconnected and that's can become an increasing challenge. So I'm gonna just flip through these quickly, um, but as I mentioned, uh, the particular um, challenges facing Massachusetts, uh, these are not future challenges, right? So these are things that we already are experiencing today. So we have heat waves, we have these heavy rain events. I think everyone here is familiar with that. Um, these temperature extremes, and again, this is not uh, just happening on land. The ocean is also seeing what we call marine heat waves and the Gulf of Maine, which encompasses the whole uh, southeastern New England and, and northern New England region here, is one of the fastest warming parts of the ocean on the entire planet, and that has a lot of impacts as well. Um, and then, as I've touched on a couple of times, something sort of near and dear to my heart as both a coastal resident and as someone studying melting ice sheets is coastal inundation. And I do believe this, this is one of the largest risks that is facing the state of Massachusetts. And we think about coastal flooding from a range of everything from extreme events, so that's talking about things like hurricanes, the Great New England hurricane, and that um, far left figure is actually showing a house uh, that was swept off its foundation um, down in, uh, I think it was about the New Bedford area and swept all the way up the Cape Cod Canal and kind of came to rest across the abutment of the Bourne Bridge. Um, so that just highlights kind of these extreme nature of these events. We also have these big winter storms, which are sort of tend to be seasonal. Um, so the center image is, is a first responder in Boston um, trying to evacuate people um, in an area that, you know, we don't tend to think of as underwater. And then we're increasingly seeing these recurring flooding events. Um, so on the right is a neighborhood in Hull, Massachusetts, not far from where I live in Situate, which is starting to see what we call this high tide flooding events, where just on these repeatedly higher and higher tides, neighborhoods are becoming inundated. And Boston is seeing this as well. Um, many of you are familiar with the flooding that's happening down around Long Wharf or the Seaport District. Um, who here has seen the new inundation district film that's been making the rounds? Some of you. I haven't actually seen it yet, but I think it really does highlight the challenges with developing in an area that's becoming increasingly underwater. So Boston has been experiencing these historical flooding days. Um, this figure is uh, about over the last century or so, 1920 to 2020. And what you see is an increase in the number of these historical flooding days over that period of time. It was fairly infrequent. Um, so you have days on the x-axis from zero to 20 in that 100-year time period. I want you to focus on that yellow 20 number, and I'm going to show you what some very accurate, uh, uh, we think, projections look for towards the next 100 years for Boston. This is because of sea level rise. So here's 20 down there on the left. That's 2020. We're now looking out towards 2100. So what we really can you know, know and should be planning for um, is the fact that these 20 days, which now seem kind of extreme when they happen, uh, we're going to be wishing for them again. Um, this is at the very low end. By mid-century, we're going to start to see Boston experiencing these flooding days um, you know, almost every third day of the year. And by the end of the century, well, you can connect the dots. Coastal inundation is also an increasing national risk. Um, and one of the things I just want to highlight here as well is, is really two factors when it comes to the challenges with, with flooding in general. Um, one, and this was startling to me when I discovered this, um, and maybe it shouldn't have been, uh, but I hadn't really thought, I had thought about you know, how we need to protect ourselves from sea level rise and coastal change and we need to retreat or we need to build barriers or things like that. Um, but actually there's still so much action moving people towards risk, moving infrastructure towards risk, creating new development, new communities, um, moving towards the coast when we really need to be doing everything we can to uh, figure out how to step backwards. Um, but some studies have suggested that future um, well thought out population change dynamics could increase, increase the flood risk four times over the climate impacts. So think about that for a minute. These are problems we can solve, even if we are slow to change the climate crisis. And these impacts are also borne disproportionately by poor communities. And that is a topic that deserves much more attention than I'm giving it today. But so many more of these challenges are borne on the backs of um, poorer communities. And of course, there's the global scale. 
uh, people are affected by rising seas worldwide, we're going to be seeing uh, close to half a billion or more people um, not able to live in their communities and homes by the end of the century under these high carbon emission scenarios. And think of the risks and destabilization that that will cause. Okay, so I'm going to have to go a little quicker, I think. <laughs> Good news, you're all here today because you know that action is necessary. This is great. People around the world and the country agree with you. So, you know, as someone pointed out at the top, you know, we don't need to spend a lot of time convincing people that this is important. Um, what we need to do is figure out how to come together collect collectively and create a new future that is safer and protects the things that are important to us. Figuring out the big why. There's one of the breakout sessions later today is gonna help with messaging, maybe more than one. Uh, how do you connect with people to help them figure out to prioritize things like climate action or clean energy? And by far, this is uh, work that the Potential Energy Coalition has done, um, which is uh, partners with Science Moms. And what they've done uh, over worldwide um, marketing campaigns and polling really is figure out that uh, 12 times more people believe that it's important to act on climate to protect the planet for future generations than things like economic growth um, or even health impacts, all of which are important. But it's important to know maybe what that front door you want to come in and what that message you want to lead with. And I'll just reflect back for a second on 100 years, which again, as I pointed out at the very beginning, seems like a long time, but it's not. The, figure, the picture on the left is one of my, these are both of my grandmothers and both of my daughters in the middle there. Um, that's 100 years. Uh, my grandmother lived to be 101, and she was in her mid-90s when my daughter was born, right? That's not a long period of time. And think out the next 100 years, when my kids meet their first great grandkids, you know, if all goes well for them. Um, you know, this is a future, this is, these are people that we care about. This is a future we want to protect. I'll skip that one. Okay, so I've just got a few more kind of on climate action. You're going to be spending a lot more time the rest of today talking about things like climate action. I don't need to, uh, to tell you that we need to reduce fossil fuel pollution and increase renewable energy, right? So at a quick glance, these two figures seem great. You have fossil fuels uh, on the left, perhaps not growing as fast as they were. That's a little bit debatable over this period of time. And then you see the rapid growth of renewables on the right. But I've tricked you a little bit with the scales here, OK? Because this is actually what that looks like. We are not meeting this challenge at anywhere near the scale that is necessary. We are doing great. The fact that we have all these tools and technology available is incredible. And there's so much more to come. And I, I'm fundamentally very optimistic about where we are headed. But there is no way to sugarcoat this. We are not meeting this need at the scale that is necessary. And if you look, that's globally. If you look at the national scale, similarly, you see on the left US energy consumption really since the pre-industrial era, so 1776 to the present. In blue are fossil fuel use. In green are renewables. So if you focus on that green, this looks fantastic, right? We're increasing our renewables. They're cost effective. They're cleaner. There's so many great benefits. But we're also increasing our fossil fuel use and our total energy use over that time. And hand in hand in that, on the right-hand side, we as a nation are really the leading exporter of fossil fuels to the world, feeding the world's fossil fuel energy usage. So while it's wonderful that we're increasing renewables at home and we have all of these great goals from our communities to our national scales, um, we are also continuing to drill and to pipe and to pump and to move uh, these fossil fuel polluting exports around the world. So in order to bend this curve down as are needed for these climate targets, we really require transformative action. I don't have the solutions for that. I hope many of you here in the room have some ideas, but if nothing else, you can all be connected to people that can make these changes. And I'm excited to see so many of you here um, working on that. I'm gonna skip this uh, slide because this takes a little bit of time to go towards, but I just wanna talk about adaptation for one second. When we talk about this decisive decade for action, we don't just mean changing our energy systems and our 
greenhouse gas emissions and our fossil fuels. We also need to talk about the fact that we are already living in a changed world, that climate is already impacting our communities, our homes, our cities, our built environment. And we need adaptation also at a transformative scale to protect ourselves. We can't just hope that the future will be better. We need to be protecting already um, all these things that are important to us, and we need to do that in a transformative way. And I'll just, an example in a coastal community would be, you know, can we even talk about managed retreat in some areas? Right now, that's kind of a third rail. And so we tend to ignore it. Or we, again, in surprising ways, continue to build and move towards the coast. Who doesn't want to live on the coast? Um, but that coast is not going to be where it is in the future. OK, so I'm just going to end with a couple um, uh, more calls to action. You're already here because you think globally and act locally. And that is fantastic. And it's wonderful to see that energy. And you all know, I think, that community is so important, building community to take these actions. And what I want to ask of you today here is to take that energy and that information and those communities and networks that you've built and don't stop there with locally. Because as I hope I've even just woken your eyes a little bit too, the scale at which change is needed, the scale of the problem is so much greater um, really than I even like to wake up and think about. So we need to act locally, yes, and that is critically important. But we also need to be part of communities and conversations and policies that act regionally. And some of that may be uncomfortable because it may require thinking about corporate or you know, private connections or how do we change energy transmission systems or you know, just as something to think about, you know, if you're building a big solar farm, do you need to cut down a forest? Like, I'm not advocating one or the other, but there are going to be some tricky conversations we had. But regional action is also an important piece of this. There's nothing really that can move the needle nationally without having large national, um, you know, goals, whether it's creating um, EV corridors, right? Think of what was done with the Highway Act, creating highways all the way across this country. We need something of that scale to create charging corridors if we're all gonna be driving electric cars. We need to put pressure on the companies that are causing this pollution, that are changing our world day by day. And we need to vote. And then globally, right? There is a lot that can be done at the local, regional, and national level, but the largest things, the things that really are gonna move the needle if you think about protecting the oceans, uh, the, the UN just passed the High Seas Treaty last year, which aims to conserve 30% of the open ocean that's owned by no one by 2030. There's also large scale global targets like under the Paris Agreements. This requires coordinated international action. And it also requires really connecting to multinational businesses and governments around the world. So those are all different pieces of the puzzle. And so I ask you all today to think about how you can connect, not just locally, but at all these other scales in everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another round of applause. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so we are, we are moving. We're going to move quickly now into our next uh, showcase. Um, so please just stay where you are. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna try to make up a little bit of lost time. Um, but we have now the panels and the showcase coming up. So I'm going to have Ellen introduce us. Great, Nathan. Thanks, Ellen Tone. I'm uh, on the board of Mass Energize. I want to invite our speakers up. So I need Nick, Jonathan, uh, Lori, Diane, Amy, Jillian. And you're sitting in the order where I put, look at your seats. There's a name tag on your seats. <coughs> so sit there. <coughs> hey, Lori. Good. Um, so most importantly, uh, for my speakers, before I forget to say this, um, Vicki, raise your hand. Every, all my speakers, look at Vicki's hand in the green. This is a speed dating panel. You're going to get to hear from these people. I've required them to only speak for five minutes. So they're going to get a two minutes and a one minute to remind them where they're at. So let me um, say a few words before. Um, the panel starts. You could leave the last session and feel a little depressed. And what I'm going to tell you is the antidote to depression is action. 
and we actually know this from studies that have been done on climate actions, and Yale gets a lot of credit for this, the, the, the solution to the depression anxiety we're seeing, particularly in young people, is action and agency. And I think Jonathan's going to talk a little bit about the sense of feeling agency. What can I do? And you're in this room because you have an instinct towards agency. That's what I need to ignite, amplify, and scale. So this, all right, now thank you, Frank. <laughs> no, that's what you're talking my house. Um, so we need to be vocal and we need to be visible in what we are doing. So this showcase is going to give you a window and uh, we could have made 40 people a part of this showcase because you're all doing amazing things. So we're going to hear from cities. So where is Jillian? Oh, she's hiding back. Jillian is uh, represent Nick and Jillian, um, Nick from uh, Weston, Jillian from Natick are going to talk about city actions, and Jillian's going to talk about regional, how we can work together across cities and towns. Jonathan's going to give us a window into the youth voice and students action. Uh, Lori's going to talk about how, the role, what local businesses are doing to help us achieve our climate goals and how they're important partners. And lastly, there are a lot of community leaders. I chair my local energy committee and help run our local um, community-based group in Wayland. All of you, 40% of the attendees here are people like that, and you all play really critical roles in making this happen. We know that the majority of emissions in most of our towns in the Commonwealth come from household, household homes and cars. In my town, it's 79%. I think Jillian and Natick, it was like, over six, about two thirds of your emissions and Natick's pretty commercial. So that we need to really energize individuals, neighbors, residents to do two things, take action on their own and to support the kind of local policy change that is needed. We need climate citizens. So you'll hear examples about all of uh, those actions from the towns. I'll let them each, I'm gonna turn it over to Nick, the know the order they're going in and they have five minutes each. Say one sentence about who you are. You got your five minutes, and I have about 10 minutes, I hope, for questions at the end. That looks like mine. Hi, I'm Nick Crispin. I'm the chair of Weston Sustainability Committee, and I'm here to talk about passing the Specialized Energy Code in, in your community, and uh, to talk about doing it in, in three easy steps. One, two, three. Uh, that's simple, right? Um, but in our case, the, the three steps were to go figure out the right message for why in your community. And I'll show you a little bit about what that looked like in Weston. And I'll tell you it was a lot easier than I thought because the zero carbon MA resource has the slides that were used for about 30 different communities out there. And you can go find one that resonates with you and use it pretty easily. I loved uh, Bedford. Um, then you do the outreach to all the appropriate groups in public set up a, a tracker, go make it happen. We'll show you what ours look like. Julie, our Western Sustainability Coordinator, helped us a lot. And then um, finally, remind folks to get off the Lazy Boy, turn off Netflix, and show up to vote when your, your town meeting comes. Um, so just looking at the, the messaging on Specialized Energy Code, I think the, the good news is that there's a lot of resources to build a simple, strong message. What it is, build energy related for buildings, it affects new construction only. And I think a big point is that in your community, change is coming if you have the stretch code. So you're, you're, there's no option to stay the same. You pick between keeping the updated stretch code or moving forward to the specialized energy code. Why? 68% uh, of our emissions were in buildings, and this is the number one lever we can take. If you have a climate action plan in your community, you can't hit it unless you adopt the specialized energy code. That was true in Weston. It makes it simple. Second. Your town's in the state of Massachusetts, and Massachusetts is going to phase out fossil fuels, so your homeowners will be subject to expensive retrofits if you don't act. Number three, it's a 100% standard bylaw, which helps everyone feel comfortable, including building inspectors. And number four is you have to do it to get climate leader funding. So there's a whole presentation that sits behind that, but getting that story straight, clear, and crisp makes the next step of outreach a lot easier. So what did we do? This is a, a, a convoluted looking sample of our outreach tracker, but I actually wanted to share it to help you see that it's not that overwhelming. We started with our select board. 
we had two big meetings, one with builders and developers in our town, one with an open session for the public. And then we went to all the groups, your finance committee, your permanent buildings committee, um, our planning board, conservation, historical commission, our council on aging, so on, and gave the same presentation so people understood what was going on. The other thing that made this a lot easier for me, because I have no experience with anything, is that uh, local builders, there's some green ones that will help. You can probably find those from other communities nearby that have done this. And DOER, I actually see Dylan uh, over there from DOER, who probably attended four or five different of my meetings and really helped anchor this and what the state is doing. Um, so by running through that whole schedule, um, we set ourselves up for, uh, to go to town meeting, have everybody know what was going on, and, um, and do it. And I guess lessons learned stepping back. Uh, when I started, everybody was really anxious and tense. Uh, in our town, private property matters. This is going to cause fights. Uh, and in the end, it did not. It passed 142 to 36 with little drama. I think that's less to do with me and more to do with the code, which is easy to adopt. The resources, zero carbon and builders, DOER that are there to help you see that it's pretty straightforward, well documented and easy to do. Um, and the last is that we did this all in about three months and it was a relatively um, straightforward initiative, um, though certainly took, took the time to go out to the community and, and make it happen. I think that's all I have to say. I uh, usually get more boring after four minutes, so I'll give one back and, uh, and keep it moving. <laughs> Um, hi, thanks for your interest in electrified Brookline. My name is Diane Sokol. I volunteer with the Brookline chapter of Mothers Out Front, and I'll start with a bit of our campaign history. Brookline is fortunate to have many climate volunteers in Mothers Out Front, Elders Climate Action, and also Climate Action Brookline. We also have climate leaders in town meeting, in town hall, and in our state legislators. We work collaboratively on the core climate issue, which is our need to transition off fossil fuels. In 2018 and 19, Mothers Out Front organized townwide greenhouse fest events, offering a way for our residents to see in person how they could make these changes in their own homes. But when COVID came, we had to cancel our 2020 event and come up with a new approach. So continuing our neighbor to neighbor strategy, we produced three Zoom discussions called Decarbonize Your Home. Uh, one for a local neighborhood group and two for houses of worship. We presented some background info and then members from the community shared work that they had already completed, insulation, solar panels, heat pumps. The feedback we received showed the importance of using trusted neighbors and community members to motivate others to take action. So we asked our Mothers Out Front members, what barriers are keeping you from electrifying? We heard about lack of clear info, not knowing where to start. Renters and condo owners wanted to know what they could do. And of course, fi financing and finding contractors were big concerns. So we started with the information gap. A group came together and took on this challenge. We outlined the guides and the background info and strategized neighborhood-based um, communications. Sorry, uh, we, want, we thought that it was important for the guides to live on the official town website. So we worked with town staff who reviewed our guides and posted them on the sustainability page. One year after starting, we launched Electrify Brookline at um, our Brookline annual community event. Our volunteers staffed tables and walked around with sandwich boards announcing the great news that Brookline had climate solutions. It was a terrific opportunity to engage with residents about what they can do to improve their own homes. So if you Google Electrify Book Brookline, they'll come to the town page, this page on the town website. We have an overview guide, a planning checklist, and eight specific how-to guides. In the first six months, we had about 700 unique visits to the site, and we look forward to having more. The two-page checklist helped residents get started. With permission from Newton, we modified their checklist. Each section references the relevant how-to guides, and we also highlight actions that renters can take. All of the how-to guides have the same format. They explain what the equipment is, how it can help the climate, and what's involved with making a switch. 
We also cover costs, electrical work, and rebates from Mass Save. Thank you. Each guide also includes stories of how Brookline neighbors made the switch. So in Brookline, more than half of our residents are renters. So we created an additional guide highlighting opportunities specifically for renters. And it also includes some resources about how renters can work with their landlords on energy improvements. We have a detailed resource guide about financial incentives, summarizing the money from Mass Save and from the Federal Inflation Reduction Act. And we also produced a green contractors list with recommendations from our Brookline neighbors about electricians, plumbers, HVAC contractors. And coming soon, we plan to have additional resource guides for condo owners and for landlords, plus a how-to guide about EVs and chargers. We're working on a short promotional video, and I see that my time is up. But we want to make sure that everyone knows who in the community to, to speak to. Thank you. I'll do my job. So I'm so honored to be here with all of you because uh, for, I heard three speakers today, uh, and of course the words you said are just spectacular. And to be in a room filled with people who are committed to the, the work we're doing is just um, fantastic from, from my point of view. So I'm happy to be here. So uh, thanks for being here. It's very, very energizing. So. Like Sarah had mentioned, um, I have a number of different hats here, and I'm only going to mention the hats just to give you an idea of what's happening around uh, New England, uh, Massachusetts, and the country regarding local business. So I'm, I'm the owner of the Longville Health Clubs, some of you may have heard of. Uh, I'm the founder and executive director of the Sustainable Business Network of Massachusetts that I founded in 1988, um, which is 36 years old, and we've been working to, when we were, in those days, the idea of a socially responsible business was an oxymoron. And, and, and I went to, when I went to college, which was back in the 19th century, when we were doing it, the people we, going to, the people went to business school, we weren't talking to. Because the work we were doing, the business people, they just, they weren't in the same planet that we were. But that's changed a lot, and we're very grateful about that. Um, so I do want to mention that, that um, well, I was born and raised in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I was one of the, uh, the first organizers of the Salt Lake City, Utah Earth Day celebration in 1970. So, and, and I've been doing that work ever since. And I started becoming an environmentalist when I was an Eagle Scout at Utah. So I'll tell you more about that another time. But I, I, I do want to just say that, that the Sustainable Business Network, the, our definition of sustainable is the intersection of in local, in economies that are local, meaning locally owned, independent businesses that are contributing to the community every day. Green, which is doing and having good, strong environmental practices, and SBN created the first uh, program called the Sustainable Business Leader Program in the country for small businesses to become more green. It's a 100-page questionnaire, very inexpensive. We certified 150 businesses and many bank branches and many, many other businesses. And the other one is fairness, which is uh, commonly referred to now as, as, as uh, uh, equitable, and just and um, uh, inclusive. And so we're, that's that combination where that intersection is, and we're trying to do all of those things. Well, about two and a half years ago, uh, we realized that the state of Massachusetts had set a goal of having 50% of our energy being created from um, renewable resources. And when I looked around at seeing that that was actually a possibility, nobody really thought we were going to do it two and a half years ago, and certainly was clear that we weren't going to do it if we don't solarize like crazy every single possible way we can in Massachusetts. It can't happen without solar energy. It's not going to happen to anything else we're doing without a huge component of solar energy. So we organized, and luckily, a lot of solar energy companies that are local, that are green, that are out there doing the work. And, and out of that group, we formed a group called Go Mass Solar, which is doing everything we can to create um, solar energy uh, panels as, wherever we can. At my club in Natick, we just completely plastered the whole place just recently with solar panels, and we completely changed the heat pumps. So all the energy that we do to heat and air condition our facilities are being done with heat pumps, all of them with electricity, and all of them are being covered by our solar energy. So we love that balance, and we, we encourage all of you to, to find that ways to do that. Um, the, um, the last thing I want to say, and because I saw my two-minute thing up, is uh, is that I do recommend, since we're all out here trying to do the good work, 
to use the concentric circle model of, of personal change, of growth and change in our world. And that's why the, the pebble in the pond and the way you start with that pebble is what's going on with you. So take care of yourself, be good to yourself, make sure you're healthy, then take care of your family, your home, your job, your, your community, your state, your nation. And two last things. One is um, I, want, I want to know that everybody here know that the most important thing we can do a, as a U.S. citizen is to make sure in November we get the right people elected. That's the number one thing. Because if we have the wrong person elected, the work we're doing is going to be incredibly more difficult. And I know you people have been sitting down, so if you please stand up for just a minute, we're going to do a cheer. Okay, could you please stand up? And the cheer is Go Mass Solarize. Is that the name of the school? Mass. Go Mass Solarize. Go Mass Solarize. And then we're going to say Go Massachusetts, and then we're going to say Go Earth. So you're going to put your hand up in the air, the fist first. Okay, now bring it down here, and we're going to say Go Mass Solarize. Go Mass Solarize! Let's go. Next one's Go Massachusetts. Go Massachusetts! And finally, Go Earth! Okay, there you go. Here we go. All right, I am here to talk to you about the plug-in campaign, which is a campaign that we're doing in Metro West. And um, right now in Natick on our main street, we have a banner that lists Natick, Acton, Framingham, and Wayland on it. And it tells residents that they can visit the website to learn more about plug-in and electrifying their homes. And the reason that I'm excited about the plug-in campaign and about all the work that we're doing is because as we heard from the previous speakers, and as we all know, we have, we're in a really transformative time. And I personally find that time incredibly exciting and incredibly scary. It's hard. There's a lot to do. And one of the things that we need to do is just generate as many ideas as we possibly can. And we need to create an ecosystem for those ideas that's positive, that motivates people, that we still want to be a part of. So we don't just get depressed, like someone said earlier, as people working in the space and just, you know, throw in the towel. We need to stay engaged. And one of the things that drives me crazy working in the space is when we're doing it in silos. So we really need all of our ideas to be coming together and we need to be talking about them. And one of the things that I have been personally passionate about as a sustainability staff person in Natick is to sharing my ideas and to giving people Word documents that they can just copy and paste. My biggest like mantra is copy and paste. If you're doing something great, I'm just going to copy and paste it. You know, that, that's what we should be doing. And things like those toolkits, I'm going to copy and paste those toolkits. Those are great. And I'm happy that most of the faces I'm seeing in here, I, I recognize your faces. We're doing a lot of great work together. And so that's what our regional campaign plugin is about. Plugin is an effort that is supported primarily by Mass Energize with the collaboration of our communities. It is funded through a line item in the state budget that required a lot of outreach and support with legislatures. So that was really exciting. And through that campaign, we're doing something a little different. It's, it's similar to a Solarize or a Heat Smart campaign, but in reality, it's a little more freeing. We don't have the um, requirements of the mass save language or the you know, Solarize procurement requirements, and Mass Energize is leading it, and we're, we're working together. Um, the campaign focuses on heat pumps, on rooftop solar, and also community solar. And one of the innovative things that we've been doing through it is Mass Energize did a procurement or an RFP to help identify community solar providers that weren't so sketchy is uh, something that was important to us because we have residents coming to us as municipal staff and having their doors knocked on and having mixed experiences with different vendors from community solar to heat pumps to, as we all know, um, electricity suppliers. And that has made it hard for us to advance some of the clean energy work. So we have two um, community solar uh, companies that have been procured for this campaign. And I think that our, it's, it makes it easier for us as municipal staff to recommend them to our residents or to say, this is a resource that you can look at. The other things that we're doing with the campaign are trying to infuse more humor and joy into our messaging and get people who don't usually talk to us, people who aren't on our newsletters to learn about what we're doing and reach them in different ways. Um, you're going to hear from some of our partners through the Community First Partnership uh, program with Mass Save, but that's another way that we're kind of combining efforts and working to get the word out in different ways. So um, thanks to Mass Energize for their help on that, and happy to talk to you more. Thank you.
Um, I want to say, where's uh, Sean? Are you here from Sunwell? Sean. Over here. Yeah. So uh, the two, um, and Mike from Nexam somewhere? I know I'll I saw Mike here. earlier. Yeah, Mike. So uh, the uh, RFP the Mass Energize did with Natick, Whalen, Acton, and Framingham identified two community solar providers that have space in their projects. That's always a question. And Nexam, uh, if you want to learn more about community solar, you can see Mike over there and Sean over there. And also as a co-sponsor, uh, the Sun Wealth offering is um, is targeted to low and moderate income households and will save over 20% of your electric bill. The market rate one saves about 12%. So if you want to learn more about community solar, you can go over to Sun Wealth and Mike can gravitate there. So thank you to both of those uh, partners with us. Jonathan, take it away. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan Lan. I'm a senior at Weston High School. I'm president of our Students for Environmental Action Club, uh, a member of Nick's Sustainability Committee, and I'm also a, an organizer for Our Climate, which is a, a national youth-led advocacy group with a branch in Massachusetts. Um, so today, I'd love to share about sort of youth involvement with advocacy, our connection with our town, and our, our, our team's ongoing campaign for climate justice. And so I just want to shout out my team that, that's come to attend this event in the back, and, and thank you to Mass Energize for, for inviting us all here. So sort of the, the origins of our, of our club really started with, with civic engagement, but really like that, that's allowed us to connect with our town at a deeper level. Uh, but before that sort of like outgrowth of our, of our campaign, we really were a school focused club. We did a lot of recycling events at school. Uh, we did lettuce planting, plastic bag collection, like all of these things. And, and I think two things really allowed us to expand our impact and reach a broader community. One of them was joining the Massachusetts Youth Climate Coalition, attending statewide lobbying events, and really organizing with other students at a very statewide level. And the other is the fact that we go to a public school, and town leaders sort of tend to hear about what we're doing in the schools. And so I was really surprised when our sustainability coordinator, Julie Gagan, and Phoebe Byerly reached out to me, and were like, hey, we want to work with you and really try to advance our town climate goals as sort of a, a collective uh, group. Um, and that, that was sort of a transformational moment for us. Here's actually a slide of us sort of advocating uh, to, to become part of the sustainability committee and, and continuing to connect with our town uh, at a more formal level. So one thing that's really been great about this connection with the town and the sustainability committee is that we've really been provided a lot of platforms to, to share our stories, to advocate for policy, and, and to really like have our voices be heard. Uh, so this is a picture of me actually at that special, uh, special town meeting, uh, working with Nick to, to pass that specialized energy code. And the other two pictures are, are of me advocating for, for climate education in the classrooms in front of the school committee. And so these opportunities really wouldn't be possible without my, my connection with, with my town leaders that I'm really deeply grateful for. And the important thing I think to note is that students really want to be engaged in, in these issues. They want to be engaged in ag advocacy, and we have a lot of energy to do so. Uh, but, but really, sometimes we don't know what sort of opportunities are out there unless sort of we're, we're connected with these opportunities. Another thing that's really special about Weston, I think, is that we really have a close connection with our community. We have a close connection with all of our schools. Uh, and so really, we, we try to give back as much as possible. So here's some pictures of our, our STEM night in which we, we connected with elementary schoolers uh, from the Weston district. Uh, one of our huge campaigns right now is an energy efficiency campaign. So we're, we're powering down the district through behavioral change and, and sort of uh, this is like the first year of our campaign. So we're doing a lot of monitoring right now. Uh, we conducted an energy audit and we, we really were seeing that Weston is spending a million dollars on energy every year to power all of our school, uh, power the school district. So really it's, it's an area in which we, we have a lot of potential for change. I think it's also important to, to really encourage others to lead. Uh, Eva, who, who's part of, our, part of our team, is organizing a tree planting event on, on public land, and 211 trees have been ordered in Wesson. Thomas is part of our uh, uh, leaf blower working group, so he's going to be looking at CO2 pollution and noise pollution in Wesson, and I think it's really great that he's taking initiative on this. 
And, and I think really, I think as organizers, it's easy to, to sort of pinpoint one focal person that, that might be, that might have more capacity or more energy. But it is important, I think, to really engage uh, broadly as well as deeply with, with youth leaders. So really, I, I want to end by having sort of, oops, sorry, back is this, um, sort of sort of four key takeaways on, on how districts can really effectively engage with youth. It comes with empowerment and empathy. It comes with elevating youth voices, providing us platforms at sustainability committee meetings or town meetings. Uh, it comes with asking for input. I, I really appreciate Nick and, and Julie actually for, for constantly checking in with youth voices and seeing uh, what like how what our ideas uh, are or, and how we can sort of advance town goals with our with our ideas and really I, th I think building these connections in the classroom are really important having that structure to, to have students really know about these opportunities and engage with these opportunities during their school days I think is really important because students have a lot we don't uh, our, our full-time job is as students and we we can't be activists uh, unless we're sort of supported in this way. Um, so I, if, if you're interested in, in learning more about engaging with youth, I'd encourage you to also join uh, and attend the next panel session, which is called Engaging, for you, uh, engaging with Youth. Um, and I, I hope to see you there. Thank you. I just wanted to say a word from the committee perspective in Weston that um, we got Jonathan and the SEA more involved about six months ago. It's been one of the best things we've done. They bring energy like we can't believe, probably more than the rest of us combined. Uh, their perspective has been super valuable and thoughtful and also helps us see angles of things happening in town that we don't through the schools. Um, and lastly, they've just really helped us advance things faster. So thank you, Jonathan. Thank you to all the SEA members who've come in, in bulk today. And if you haven't done this, I, I think it's a, it's a really positive step in your town. So I'd recommend it for, for your committee. Good morning. My name is Amy Puelka. I'm the community lead for Energize Framingham. And I'm gonna tell you about our grassroots effort to grow curbside composting in Framingham. Okay, so like many of you, um, our activists really started out as a um, clean energy and policy driven minded group. So asking the question when we started why curbside composting was actually pretty important to our group. And so I've listed some of the reasons here. And first and foremost, like you've heard from the other speakers, is really having those passionate, energetic people able to drive the, the um, idea forward. Um, the other two main reasons that we focused on curbside composting were that everyone eats. So in theory, if everyone has access to the right services, they'll be able to do curbside composting. It's a great equalizer. Um, and also that putting out these little green bins that Black Earth Compost provides as part of their service is a very visible action in your community and you can see its growth over time. This is a problem of scale. This slide is the amount of waste transported by the Framingham Department of Public Works every day. And you can see that we estimate about a third of our pounds um, per day uh, being able to be diverted into the composting stream, about 45,000 pounds of potentially compostable material per day. And so we started to get the word out. And when we started, we had 220 subscribers to Black Earth Compost in Framingham. And we reached out to people on social media. We held um, a press release and a coffee hour. We had someone, um, our volunteer tabling at the farmer's market. We went to school fairs, the usual. Um, and within six months, we grew our subscription to over 300 members, which dropped the price by 30% for all subscribers. That was a great talking point to keep growing. Another goal that we had, though, was to really reach out to some of the diverse communities in our, um, in, within Framingham. So we partnered with the Walsh Middle School PTO and received a small grant from the New England Grassroots Environmental Fund to, to con conduct some outreach and to provide um, seven subsidized subscriptions for six months to Black Earth Compost. And through the PTO, we were able to connect with a couple different communities, including the largest Brazilian parish in Framingham, recruited those participants, 
and the six months has been completed and four of them are continuing on with paying their own funds. So it's a step forward. The next step we said, this is a really big problem and recruiting people one person at a time is really slow. So let's get out there and look at a systemic policy and a city action. What can we do? You see on the left, we did a uh, casual dot survey of people at Earth Day Festival um, where we asked people, are you composting already? Would you do it if you got a free bin? Would you pay for your subscription? Would you do it if you had to pay half? Would you do it if the city paid for the entire subscription? We got some data that way. We also went out and did a lot of research on what other communities were doing and how they might be paying for it. And then we went and provided public comment. So you can see our advocate, Diana Porter up there testifying in front of the city council environment subcommittee where she spoke several times providing public comment and eventually a, a full conversation on the topic. Um, we next asked residents to write to the mayor to say, we would like to see curbside composting supported by the city and will you please support that? And in response, he created a composting task force that is meeting for 18 months. And um, it's my pleasure to report, they've just issued the first set of recommendations to the mayor and we will see where those go. Thank you. And in the last minute, I'm going to tell you about the other piece of this project that rolled out, which is composting in our schools, in the cafeterias. So as we started working out with residents, we said, well, what's going on with in the schools? Is there composting? And simply by opening that door to a conversation, which we had with our director of buildings and grounds and our directors of food service, they took initiative to look around their schools and they found a champion in one of the schools willing to pilot a curbside composting program. So we worked with the key stakeholders, the principal, the champion, these two directors, and the, comp, um, the custodians in that building to create the first Framingham school cafeteria composting pilot in an elementary school. You can see in the photo at the left, our energy champion with her fifth grade green team members. And on the right are two custodial um, um, liaison at that, at that school. And so that pilot has been extremely successful. Uh, 10 seconds. <laughs> um, so uh, Energize Framingham did a lot of work to support getting that up and running, but it is now being continued, being, it's included in the budget recommendations for next year. Other schools have expressed interest and the composting task force has recommended expanding this pilot to an additional school next year. Thank you. All right, I've successfully gotten us back on time, so we've got uh, time for questions, I think. Uh, five minutes for questions. Let them rip, somebody, to anybody in, on the panel. Yeah, talk loud. Hello. I'll, I'll try answering it until your mic works because we are in the process of passing the specialized code in Natick. And it's not a cost for homeowners, actually. No? Just kidding. <laughs> I was going to say, yes, that it's um, uh, the specialized code applies only to new construction, so it won't affect any existing homeowners in town. The question of will it cost a bit more to build did come up. There's some studies from DOER that, it, that all, the all electric path would be cheaper than mixed fuel paths, um, so it actually would save money. Not everybody believed that, but we had builders on hand that could represent coming uh, either at close to cost parity or within one to three percent of normal costs to build a better home that's all electric and future proof. So we, I think we were able to use builders and DOER studies to take the sting out of that question. But the biggest thing is it doesn't affect your existing residents. Um, and that's the, the biggest thing that I help, think helps, um, helps it all smooth through. Probably the second thing I would just say on that is that if you have those conversations in specific meetings, the people who feel passionately about it or have big questions can get it out. And usually they'll, um, 
the structure of the law means that they don't carry that passion over to the town meeting and just leave it be because it's not a huge impact to them. So it made town meeting a lot easier, I think. Just plus one on that. Right. Other questions? The electricity, the electricity comes from fossil fuels. So why should I electrify everything? I mean, this is somebody who's not on solar. So. That's an easy question. In Brookline, we have uh, municipal. Oh, yeah. Oh, she was asking about how you know people say that our electric grid is all natural gas. Why bother electrifying? So you know, locally in Brookline, we have municipal aggregation. You can get 100% of the best kind of. Uh, class one recs, but overall in the state, our grid is getting greener and greener by state policy. You can look that up, you know, Google the mass renewable portfolio standards. So our gas utility is going to be the same pollution year after year after year. Our electricity is going to be cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And so why put in new gas infrastructure now? You can put in electricity. You can opt to get 100% clean electricity. You can use community solar to get, get your price reduced. And it's going to be cleaner and cleaner every year. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm just going to call. I'm just going to call out Paul in the background, Gromer, for, from Peregrine, uh, who's helping Wayland with our aggregation. So by state law now, right, we all know it's 24% on the renewable portfolio standard for renewables. But Paul, when you count in hydro and all this, we just looked at this. What's the percentage from the grid that's coming from non-fossil fuel right now? Um, so the, the total amount of clean energy is about 62% in the grid, if you include everything the state counts. Now, not everybody might want to count every single one of those percentages, but that's the ballpark. Right, so the, gr the grid is greener than most people think it is, and we can argue about whether some of the things in that calculation should be there or not, but you, um, when we think about non-fossil fuel and that, that renewable portfolio standard, right, increases every year by state law. And the more of us that do aggregation and increase the percentage of renewables, give the legislature the, you know, a little more courage to uh, accelerate that RPS at a steeper rate in the, whatever color that is, reddish. How are you getting the word out on Electrify Brookline and, um, you know, how are you driving traffic to that website? Um, so this is set up like a military campaign or a political campaign. We have all of our 17 town meeting precincts. We have precinct leaders that are reaching out, the precincts somewhat align with our school districts and our neighborhood associations. So using all, all these networks to get people interested, putting out newsletters. Um, unfortunately, Brookline has been without a sustainability director for the past nine months or so. So we need a little bit more help from town hall, you know, once we get a new sustainability director. But right now it's just boots on the ground, people in the neighborhoods, and town meeting members really pushing it. Yeah, I would um, add on plug-in, we're trying to reach people that we don't usually reach. I really love this approach you're taking with your um, town meeting um, reach out. And we're working on, as we mentioned earlier, some social media that you're welcome to use. You can reshare it. Um, most of our work is done through Mass Energize and um, we're hoping to make some of these resources more available through their their portal, which I think many of your communities are part of. Um, and we are hosting different webinars and in-person events um, in different places too, and working with different partners. So instead of just hosting something at the library, like I always do, now I'm going to a local temple, I'm doing something at our farm, I'm going to be doing something with our um, veterans community. So trying to speak to people that I don't know, we were at the Rotary Club the other day. They're a really great group of influential local business owners I didn't know most of them. So trying to talk to new people um, who are really key influencers in our community. 
All right, I think um, I regrettably, I'm gonna have to call it Nathan says, so Alex and, and uh, KJ and person whose name I don't know, uh, feel free to meet these people at the break and I just I wanna thank them all. Look, here's the thing, we're all trying lots of stuff. I think we're successful if we're doing and learning. So I just encourage you all to be reflective practitioners and share what you're learning amongst us, right? Um, because it has to go faster. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent panel. One more round of applause for the panelists. Okay. So, so we are now having our first break. Um, we're gonna, it's going to be a little shorter. We've got 10 minutes. So 10 minutes. All right. Hey, everyone. Are we ready? Okay. Um, Hi all, my name is Sergio Velasquez Rose. I am the head of strategy and analytics at Potential Energy. Nope. Um, Potential Energy is a global nonprofit marketing firm that uses deep analytics and creative storytelling um, of private sector marketing to create public demand for climate solutions. Um, you've actually seen some of our content already today because we do work with the Science Moms brand um, and you will actually see that ad uh, one more time today. One thing that's, you know, I really want to call out to you, I'm going to go through a number of um, recommendations today as to how to communicate on climate. Um, what's really important to me is that you understand that even though there's, this is not a heavy data presentation, uh, that there is actually a significant amount of data behind all of the recommendations that we're giving. Um, so we've done uh, 3 billion ads, uh, a number of large scale in market testing. Uh, we've conducted significant surveying and polling, a uh, number of focus groups and spent 2,500 plus hours speaking to citizens and understanding their concerns about climate, what motivates them to act on climate, um, et cetera. And so we take a very scientific and data-driven approach to the way in which we do uh, climate messaging. Um, one thing that I'll go ahead and explain because I get this question a lot when I um, present any of our work, I'll talk a lot about lift. Um, lift refers to the treatment impact um, which is to say how much higher or lower is support for climate action uh, after exposure to a particular stimulus or message. This is a um, tried and true scientific method. It's similar to what, you know, when you hear the words clinical trial, um, it's a similar type of, um, type of testing. What a great day for, carbon, for decarbonization. So no one ever, <laughs> right? So the whole point is climate change has a communications problem. We're using words that don't connect with people. And most citizens lack foundational knowledge about climate change, right? The leading perceived cost of climate change in the US is plastics, when in fact, as we heard from Dr. Das earlier, it is fossil fuel consumption. Um, about half think that recycling will have a significant impact on climate change. Less than 20% realize that renewables have gotten less expensive, even though we know that the cost curve has been exponentially coming down. Only 30% think that diet can affect climate change when in fact um, our agriculture systems contribute a significant portion of carbon pollution. And less than 25% think that there's scientific consensus on climate change. And I would love to ask Dr. Das to tell us what that number should actually be. There we go. If you didn't hear that, she said 99%. Um, and the last 1% are being paid for by some suspicious people. Now here's a challenge, right? Um, we have an amazing scientist here with us today who spoke to us about the science behind climate change, but she also put a human face to it. Um, and a lot of the words that other scientists are using out there are you know, about sea levels rising, getting to net zero, decarbonization, anthropogenic climate change. These are words that don't connect on a human level. Um, and what politicians say is also not connecting, right? So creating good paying jobs, we've seen time and time again in our data, this is the least effective way to communicate why we need to act on climate. 
um, spurring innovation or lowering the cost for everyday Americans. These are concepts that whether they be true or not true, they don't really resonate with humans on a deep level. But we do have a human solution. So what's the big why for climate? Um, Dr. Das kind of stole my thunder on this one a little bit, but I'm gonna go through it anyway. So we conducted the world's most comprehensive research on what moves and motivates people to act. Um, we covered the G20 plus a number of other countries, which is about 85% of global emissions, 85% of uh, global GDP, and 70% of the world's population. We conducted this research in partnership with the Yale Center for Climate Communications, as well as the Global Strategic Communications Council, um, which are two leading um, communications academic institutions um, that we partner with on, on, on an ongoing basis. So what is that why that the world cares about? You know, you could get some support, right, as I talked about, jobs and economic growth, that's a little bit motivating. You get three times as much motivation when you talk about social justice and inequality. You get five times that much when you talk about reducing air and water pollution, which is something that we see and feel in our day to day. Seven times when we talk about extreme weather, right? So those of you who live in Massachusetts, experiencing flooding, experiencing storms. Um, I spent a lot of time in Texas, heat waves, hurricanes, et cetera. Um, this really connects with people because we can see and we can feel that it is getting worse. But ultimately, you can get 12 times as much support for climate action when you talk about protecting the future for the next generation. And what's really interesting is that this message of later is too late, we tested it across all of the countries and in every single country, it was the highest performing motivator. Um, our friend from Rare, Frank Lowenstein mentioned earlier, we need to find a rallying cry for the movement. We need to find a unifying message that brings people together. And I would like to think that we have found it. Um, we continue to do testing on this, of course, um, but this message of later is too late to protect our kids, later is too late to protect the future, um, really seems to resonate deeply with people, much more than making polluters pay, and certainly much more than optimism. I liked what, and I can't remember who said this earlier, um, but they said the, um, the antidote to pessimism and depression is not optimism, it is actually action. So let's harness that power and let's harness the motivation behind that action. We see this, I'm not gonna dive into every data point that's here, but the point is across gender, parental status, age, education, urbanicity, ideology, across any men, uh, demographic measure, we see that this message is the most effective. As a scientist, I know by the time she takes her first breath, nine billion more tons of carbon pollution will be in the air. When she takes her first steps, wildfires will have burned millions more acres she could have explored. The day she gets her first pet, there are thousands of newly extinct species she'll never meet. The night she forgets to call, the night of her first heartbreak. Her future home floods for the first of many times. By the time a child born today goes to college, it may be too late to leave them the world we promised. Our window to act on climate change is like watching them grow up. We blink and we miss it. I know you all saw that earlier, but I can't resist showing it one more time. This is part of the incredible work that we do with Dr. Das and other uh, science moms, climate scientists who are leaning into the human side of climate communications. So here's the answer. The answer is love. Love for the next generation, love for your kids, love for your community. That is the ultimate motivator. 
So then let's get into the principles of climate communications. Um, there's not a ton of data, as I said earlier, uh, in these slides, but if you would like to hear more about any of the underlying research, um, please feel free to reach out and happy to uh, answer those questions. So there's eight principles, um, and we've published a guide that is available on our website. There will be a QR code at the end that you can scan. Um, I'm only going to cover uh, a few of them, so I've removed a couple of them that I think this group probably already is aware of. Um, to really focus on, on, on the ones that I think could have the most impact in the way that you all are communicating on, on climate. So the first is talk like a human, right? So we talked a lot earlier about, uh, you know, the decarbonization as a word not meaning a lot to everyday people or anthropogenic or even 1.5 degrees Celsius. The, the average person across the world thinks that we could get to four degrees Celsius um, and be fine. And that is, as we have seen, right, as Dr. Das showed us, if we're in the four degrees Celsius territory, we will all be on fire. Um, so we need to find a way to really connect with people in a human level and use language that they can understand. So, um, you know, there's a bunch of words kind of to avoid on the left hand side, but um, what we do find connects with people, people understand pollution. We like the words carbon pollution as opposed to carbon emissions. For, um, for some reason, it's, it's less polarizing. It feels less, less uh, political um, when you talk about carbon pollution versus carbon emissions. Um, overheating, right? Our planet is overheating. We're experiencing extreme weather. And in particular, when we talk about extreme weather, not just what the extreme weather event is, but what the impacts are, right? So the loss of lives that results from severe storms or um, the impact that it is having on our kids that our summers are getting so hot, right? So adding that next step to make it a personal connection and not just this conceptual event that exists on the planet, um, costing people too much. Um, and then, you know, 2023, I'm sure everyone knows here, and, and Dr. Das mentioned this in her presentation, but um, 2023 was the hottest year on record. 2024 is projected to beat 2023, so we will yet again have another year. Um, hottest year on record, and calling that out and for people to understand that in human history, as far as we have recorded it, we have not seen these temperatures. That is a way that um, people can understand what the impacts are without getting into sort of the nuances of exactly how many degrees Celsius we've moved up. I'm going to skip this one, but the point is, you know, when we talk about, say, Florida versus emissions, you get five times more effectiveness in your messaging. Um, the next one is no partisanship, right? So um, using language that has broad appeal and that broadens the coalition of people um, who can support climate action. Um, one thing that is not in this deck, but that is in one of our um, reports that you can find on our website is that the US has by far the most polarized political system when it comes to climate. Um, so the Republican Party is the most anti-climate action party of the G20. Um, and so we need to find ways in the US that we can appeal to a broader set of people because if only a small cohort are trying to take climate action, we will fail. Now, here's what the data tell us. When we add the words nonpartisan, we can really see a significant uptick. And here's actually a page from the Science Moms website where we specifically call out the nonpartisan aspect of the brand, um, which really helps uh, moderate women, suburban moms across the country to feel like this is a movement that they can be a part of, as opposed to feel alienated from. Some frames that, you know, are sort of narrower, um, reduce, reuse, recycle, I think we already talked about kind of why that's perhaps not the most effective um, way to tackle climate. Um, one that I think is really interesting is the word green. Um, we find in our data green, even though it's widely used, it's actually quite polarizing. It is seen as a very leftist, tree-hugging sort of perspective to it. Um, and instead, using words like clean, um, clean energy, clean power, clean vehicles, um, all of our research points to people can associate with clean. Everybody feels like they can support clean. 
whereas green, you know, as a result of, uh, of all of the politicization is really not effective in driving that. Um, and then protecting your community, conservation, preservation, safety, right? Again, bringing that human element and connecting it to be a bit more personal. The next is keep it local, right? Um, one of the things that I love about this conference is seeing all of the ways in which you all are taking action at the local level, lobbying your local officials. Um, but I will also make a plug, uh, our friend from Solarize uh, mentioned, which is we individually and locally can also become a collective. And so going out to vote, making sure that your um, state officials understand that climate is a priority for you as a citizen, making sure that your national government understands that it is a priority um, for you as a citizen really helps to drive the message. So I'm going to show you another uh, of our work here. Michiganders know that if you live north of this, you're this. Mom, look, a youper. What? And they know if you live south of this, you're this. Trolls. What Michiganders may not know is that this powers this, and this powers this. We already use homegrown clean energy, but we can do so much more. Youper. This was part of a campaign that we ran in the state of Michigan, obviously, um, to increase support for um, a clean energy standard, which um, was actually successful in passing the legislature last November. Um, it's a huge win. It's the most ambitious clean energy standard um, of any purple state in the country. So yes, a cause for applause. Setting targets of 100% clean energy by 2040, it is super ambitious and we hope that this can generate a flywheel effect um, that helps other um, policymakers to feel like this is a cost worth investing into and getting citizens behind. All right, um, I've already belabored this point so I'm not gonna <laughs> talk about this slide. Um, the next one is humans. I've said this a million times already in this presentation, but it's really about making a human connection as opposed to talking about conceptual things. What are the things that are gonna resonate with people like me, right? What are the things that at my core I believe and understand? Um, and how do you message that in a way that then connects with them? Um, one thing that we see time and time again, we've done, as I mentioned, lots and lots of creative um, testing and putting human faces, um, and in particular human faces to where you can see their eyes very deeply straight into the camera, has a significant impact in the way a piece of creative performs. Um, so instead of talking about abstract theoreticals like global competitiveness, energy independence, things like that, um, we could say people like me are being affected by extreme weather. We, you know, talk about what we call kitchen table issues, which is a very, you know, consumer marketing lens to take. Um, but, you know, higher conditioning bills, days that our kids cannot play outside. This one in particular we hear from suburban women is an increasing concern that they have is the mental health impact that our increasingly hot summers are having on children today which therefore leads them to spend so much more time on screens um, and is impacting their mental health quite severely. Um, and then loss aversion, right? If we don't stop, if we don't stop polluting, um, then we're not gonna get to the next generation. How do we, um, you know, how do we connect the pollution and make it, make it personal? Um, all right, and then our next concept, fight pollution and not climate change. So, you know, pollution framing is clarifying and it is motivating. 
Um, the idea of fighting climate change, again, feels like this very conceptual thing, but fighting pollution, that feels doable. Um, one thing that we see is, you know, we saw an 8.5% lift when we talk about holding polluters accountable. One thing that I've observed in a number of our focus groups is it really starts to click for people when we talk about the fact that there are a hundred company or there, yes, there are a hundred companies globally who are responsible for 71% of all global emissions. That feels like a problem that we can tackle with policy. That feels like a problem that we can tackle if we work together um, to address it, um, as opposed to trying to fight this sort of amorphous concept of climate change. Um, fairness and ending dependency are two frames that can be helpful. Fairness in particular, when we think about um, the profits that the fossil fuel industry has gained over the last many years, and then the impacts that climate change has had in our daily lives and our communities. Um, and then one that is actually not listed on here with regards to pollution um, that I've observed to be quite effective as well is with regards to air pollution and the impacts that that has in your personal life, particularly when we're talking about transitioning to clean transportation, um, talking about clean air and removing pollution from our um, from our streets can really resonate with the community because it is something that you can sort of see and feel and taste when you're out on the street and uh, a fossil fuel vehicle is going by. Um, and then the last point that I'll make is that messengers make the message. So who are the people that are most likely to be trusted to be uh, carrying the message for climate, right? We know that politician trust is really, really low, particularly in the United States. So we don't need politicians to be our messengers. Um, who we need are people like Dr. Das, who are scientists, but also mothers, um, farmers, doctors, firefighters, people in your community that you, um, that you trust and that you believe in. Um, we see that the messenger can really have an impact of as much as four times on the effectiveness of a message, um, depending on who it's coming from. Um, and now I'll, I'll leave you with this call to action, right? Who is the most trusted messenger in your community? And that is, that is you. Um, you should be talking to your friends and family about this issue and about what they can do about it. Um, one thing that I find really interesting that the Yale Center for Climate Communications has found is that about half of Americans, right, so not a great statistic to begin with, but about half of Americans believe that climate change is happening, that it is human cost, um, and that they are personally experiencing the impacts of climate change right now. And that right now is really important. It is not this thing that's sort of far off in the future. Um, but what's really interesting to me is that two thirds of them rarely or never discuss climate change with their family and friends. That is a huge gap. Why are two thirds of people who are concerned about climate change, who say that they understand it and they feel it personally right now, why are they not speaking to their friends and family? Um, and I really think that the underlying um, reason behind that data is the politicization of the environmental movement, of the climate change movement. Um, but what we need to do in order to break that down is to come out, to use a, an analogy from a different civil rights movement, um, but really to come out to our friends and family and talk to them about why we care about this issue, why it matters to us personally, um, and all the ways in which it impacts you as a human um, so that we can see climate progress and build a really broad coalition of support um, that can transcend what we as one individual can do. Um, I'll leave you with later is too late, um, which is our rallying cry. Um, and this QR code will take you to our website. You can sign up for our newsletter there um, and also find a number of publications, including our Talk Like a Human guide, which covers all of these concepts, um, as well as a number of other resources, including our global research. We recently published um, a document on how to communicate on electric vehicles and so forth. Um, and now I will take questions. I'm from Lexington, um, and we showed the movie Breaking Boundaries, which if you haven't seen it, it's, it, we had some people say to us they left because it was so depressing, because the, all the actions are at the end um, instead of being inserted throughout the movie. 
but <clears throat> we had a scientist in the in the audience who said that he feels that scientists themselves aren't doing a great job of really talking about the the immensity of the problem um so that people are because my grandson i was watching ancient earth some nova with him he's nine years old he looked up at me at some point and said isn't that what we're doing now this was during one of those periods of of warming and i said yes but let's have hope i talked about the ozone and he said a lot of people use the ozone as an example of success he said, but that's much smaller than what we're dealing with. So we're not, how do we get people to see the enormity? Is there a way to give people hope like a nine-year-old um, or even adults who feel like too big, I can't handle it, but yet you have to tell them it's so big. Thoughts? I do think that's a challenge. I think what I would, um, what I would advise is not anchoring so much on like how big the problem is, because that can be debilitating, right? So it's sort of this big, massive, amorphous problem. What can I as an individual do about it? Um, and instead focus again on sort of the very specific human impacts um, and the ways in which pollution is causing um, climate change as opposed to sort of climate change itself. Um, and then focus in on what is the source of that pollution, right? We know that it is fossil fuels primarily um, that has caused uh, climate change. And so um, understanding what you can do as an individual to become a collective and then take action to transition to cleaner energy. That would be my, that would be my suggestion. I, I think over anchoring on, on the bigness of the problem can actually be counterproductive to taking action because then it feels debilitating and like, well, I can't do anything about it. So I'm just going to go on with my life. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, thank you very much for these insights. I, I wonder if you can take some of it and sort of overlay it on the likes of us here. Uh, so a couple of things. One is the concept that um, most Americans of all stripes are already concerned about climate. So we're not for most people, except those we need to flow around, <laughs> um, we can start, we're not starting from zero. So that's, that's one. Two is, again, the likes of us who show up here are in ci cities and towns where there's already been activism. People have already showed up and you can just say over 10 years, the, this movement has been sort of passive. In other words, people show up because they're concerned. Um, and would you say, that, and, and, and what, what it might take is for each of those movements to grow by 10 in the next minute or two, <laughs> <laughs> no, very soon, and what, should, what lessons should they take, and I would think it would be to grab more and more of those already pre-concerned, not worry or wonder about those we need to flow around. And the last aspect of this is those that don't show up here, you know, it might be, uh, we might represent what 10% uh, of the cities and towns, 30 or so cities and towns in Massachusetts, maybe 20%. Anyway, what about the, the ones at the other end that are at the uh, uh, earlier on the adoption curve and already need, and need to move along already? We, uh, somehow they need to get going further faster than the cities and towns represented here already. Sorry for throwing that all at you, but <laughs> I presume you can handle it. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for your question. Um, I think on, on the first part of your question, um, one thing that I talked about um, when, when I was talking about you being the most trusted messenger is um, this concept of network effects, which is the way in which technology platforms build themselves, right? Facebook is more valuable for every next person that joins it um, and encourages their friends to do the same, right? Because it is a network of people that continues to build outward. Um, and that's really what I think we as individual citizens really need to, need to be doing. And so even though a significant portion of the country is already alarmed and concerned about climate change, what they understand to be the solution set is clearly not actually what the solution set is. And a lot of that confusion has been driven on purpose 
um, by the fossil fuel industry. And so what we can do is, hey, I know that you're already concerned. Um, I can help educate on what the actual solutions are. And in particular, right, you talked about your individual communities already having a lot of movement. How about your friends and family who are in states that are not as progressive or in um, parts of the state that are not as progressive? and helping them understand that, hey, you live in Florida, your hurricanes are getting worse and worse. The number of um, severe storms that we have had is exponentially growing. 2023 had 20 storms. In 2013, that number was seven. In 2003, that number was four. In 1993, that number was one. That is a pretty significant curve that, is, that they are experiencing in terms of severe storms. And so trying to drive that message and then and then from there move on to what are the solutions, right? Um, one of the things that is really astonishing is the awareness of the Inflation Reduction Act is incredibly low across the country. And despite the attempts of many people to make that awareness go up, they've been wildly unsuccessful. Um, one thing that we have found in terms of how to frame that is, hey, did you know that in 2022 um, there was a clean energy and climate plan um, that was passed in Congress and which is taking action on this and helping uh, people see that, yes, the solutions are coming, but also that, hey, there's a ton more work to do and that the solutions we find need to be systemic. So I have two specific um, language questions. Um, so we love those. <laughs> so I actually have been staying away from think globally, act locally, because I didn't see it in your report, but then I saw it in the presentation. And um, so I kind of wondered, have you tested that phrase? Um, we haven't tested that phrase specifically, but um, I do think the local aspect of that is probably the stronger part of the message than the global aspect of that. People have a, a really tribal human connection to their community um, that they don't have with the larger globe, for better or for worse. Okay. And then the, my second question is, um, I had forgotten that you say stay away from green, and we have green pages that we're just developing, which is a list of like companies. And so now I'm agonizing about what we change it to. And I'm <laughs> Clean. Clean? <laughs> uh, well, is environmental like is just the same? Environmental is just as polarizing as as green, unfortunately. Yeah, um, the sort of so-called environmental movement is seen as very, very leftist um, and not broad, unfortunately. I so know. you're suggesting it's clean. Clean is is the clean word. Pages? Is. Clean uh, pages. I'll work on it. We can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We can workshop it somewhere if you if you would like. Hi, I have a quick question more on the sort of how to frame policy solutions, which is I see that if you say we want clean energy, everybody goes, yep, want that. And then if you say we need to pay for clean energy, support drops. <laughs> and do you have any tips on how to communicate that? We try and talk about, yeah, the upfront investment will pay off over time. Paying now means we avoid these costs later. But do you have any tips on that kind of stuff? Because if you say, for example, make polluters pay, people are like, yeah, we should do that. But if that means charging fossil fuel companies who might pass that cost on to consumers, suddenly people are less supportive. So I'm curious if you have any tips on that. Yeah, this is, this is a really complex one. I'm glad you, you brought that up um, because people do have this feeling that subsidies for fossil fuel companies are benefiting them because everybody gets gas, but um, subsidies for clean energy are not necessarily for people like them because they don't, currently have a solar panel or you know a heat pump um, the framing the framing that we have found um, that tends to help is to think about how much investment particularly when in, in the home decarbonization space how much investment is required in order to maintain and support methane pipelines um, natural gas pipelines that feed into our homes and that instead of continuing to constantly fund repair add to this infrastructure, um, it's not even about like decommissioning it today, but if we can take what we would be investing in expanding it and instead put it in electrification, um, that's a net gain um, in terms of uh, 
pollution reduction, but also but doesn't have any additional oh, sorry any additional cost um, to it. So talk about the costs of the status quo, basically. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And then I do think educating. Not everyone knows that the sub like fossil fuel companies have significant like trillions of dollars worth of subsidies every year. Um, I do think that that can be elucidating for some audiences. It's not as broad as we would like it to be, unfortunately. Um, but it can it can work for certain people to realize that like, hey, we're already subsidizing this. This isn't some new thing. Cheers. I have a quick thing I want to say about that, which is that I sometimes use pay now or pay a lot more later. Um, can I add one thing to that? I actually yeah, love that you just said that because that sparked another thought. Um, another area that you can go in that messaging is we are already paying for it, yeah. right? We saw the trillions of dollars that we spend in um, climate mitigation or sorry, climate adaptation and in disaster relief every single year. And healthcare costs, blah, blah. And help, right, exactly. So my, my question is actually a very practical one and I don't, it's maybe partly for you, maybe partly for Dr. Das, but the later is too late video, mm -hmm. is that linkable from somebody's website if we want yes, to you can that. find it at the Science Moms website. Thank you. <laughs> and it's called By the Time, if you look it up on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, there's tons of other content, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you can download them, but you can definitely share the links. Yeah, they're publicly available. Yeah, you just share screen. Hi, hi, my um, particular area of action is advocating for adoption of heat pumps. And a question I often get is, what's the payback? And this came out of, I think, the fact that the previous campaigns for solar, rooftop solar, there was a, a clear payback because, largely because of the subsidies. But the reality for heat pumps, for most people, it only makes sense if they're replacing an aged system or they're adding air conditioning and even then the payback is slow to never that's just the reality of the economics of it so i'm wondering um i have an answer uh, several ways i answer the question i'm not sure if they're effective but i'm wondering what you and we want to be honest about what the costs are there it may be neutral in cost or a little bit more but as to pay back heating heating's a necessity it's not a uh, it's, it's something you need and you don't get a payback on your food uh, and other necessities, so. Um, I don't have a great answer for you, unfortunately. This is actually one of our primary fields of research for 2024. So we are just kicking off our research on how to communicate on heat pumps and building decarbonization. What I will say though, is you can point to some of the things that the prior um, question asker uh, made, which is, you know, you could pay it for it. You could pay for it in your heat pump, or you could pay for it in many, many, many other ways, including, um, you know, the health impacts of having natural gas piped into your house, um, methane leaks. Like the reason we have um, CO2 monitors in, like, in addition to fire, or sorry, carbon monoxide monitors in our homes, in addition to fire, is because of the fact that we pipe natural gas into our homes, and so removing those risks preventing asthma for your children, right? There's, there's lots of other human benefits that are not directly dollars um, that you could try to point to, but I don't have a super clear, like this is the best way to communicate on heat pumps because we are just embarking on that research now. Thank you. We'll be back next year and I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> I'm just sharing a, a quick, interesting related piece of research from MIT that says there's, they've developed a new way to quantify climate change impacts and it's called outdoor days. The number of mm. days you can be outside comfortably, not too hot, not too cold. So I just thought I'd share that with the group and you in case you check it out. Yes, we'll be harnessing the power of that on, um, on our website. Um, and I'll add one more thing to that. The, there's an organization called Climate Central um, which we also collaborate with and, and alongside the Yale Center for Climate Communications. And they've developed a tool that can let you know how much more likely your hot day was made by climate change. So you can see that a particular hot day in your neighborhood was five times uh, more likely uh, as a result of climate change, for example. And those statistics can be a really powerful way to say, hey, here's a you know, scientifically shown way 
um, that climate change is impacting our lives. They do as well. They do it kind of post facto, the heat index they're able to do on a predictive basis. Yeah. Climate Central. And they also have a website called Climate Matters. When interacting with either elected officials, thinking mayors and city councilors, or town administrators, um, can you give us suggestions of the best phrases to use? Because usually it's the the people who are already inculcated who are coming in and saying things like green and environment that probably is putting them off and they can't, you know, they're elected, they can't tell us that. So what do you suggest we use to kind of engage those people? Um, because I think they're increasingly, even in conservative towns, really feeling this, they know they need to participate. So how can we help use the right language to get them online? And secondarily, once we have them online, can we get you to come in to coach <laughs> them so they can talk to their, you know, the island people in all these cities and towns in an effective way? Um, I have cities that I work with that have zero environmental groups or green groups or sustainability groups at all. So how do I move that whole community towards these? I'm going to say two things about that. First of all, yes, I'm always happy to speak to anyone who will hear me talk. Um, <laughs> Um, one thing that we have found with policymakers is one of the biggest barriers to them wanting to take climate action is the perception that their constituents don't care or the perception that this is a politically risky position to take. Um, and so what we try to help policymakers do is understand the language that has the broadest appeal, most of which you have seen here. In your particular case, when we're talking about hyper-local um, you know, a city council or, uh, or mayor, et cetera, um, particularly in smaller communities. Um, we have started, I'll kind of give you a similar response to the other speaker, but we have started going into rural towns and communities to understand what's the messaging that most resonates there. Um, but ultimately it comes down to what are the local conditions? What is, what is an individual in this community really concerned about? One thing that we find um, is there's a lot of concern about what are the secondary effects of clean energy policy? Is there going to be an impact to our water? Is there going to be an impact to our local air and things like that? Because I think a lot of communities have been jaded by industry coming in um, and you know polluting their town and then leaving them behind. And so understanding the underlying concerns that people have um, and then sort of demystifying what clean energy can do for them. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say, uh, which sort of goes back to the, the big why, um, is kind of across all of the towns that we have done this, and this is across multiple states, um, the big why continues to be love, right? Like, how are you caring for your, for your family, for your kids? Are you leaving a future for the next generation? And, you know, can, will your kids be able to live here and thrive in this community? Um, for many years to come, or are they going to be forced to then, you know, leave because the town is kind of like left in disrepair. And I think understanding how clean energy policies and, and clean energy um, facilities can support a town can, can be really powerful. If I can make one suggestion to the gentleman, wherever he is, who's asking about heat pumps and for your study next year, <laughs> the language I'm using is you need to replace your heating system, get heat pumps, and air conditioning is thrown in for free. People love stuff for free. The eight. Go for it. Just do it. I love that. I'll throw that into my nope. discussion guide for next week. Yeah, so all us New Englanders who didn't have AC, we're going to need to get AC, and this way you get it free. This is a great point. We're, we're actually, one of the questions that we're trying to look at is like, how do you rebrand heat pumps? Because the, a heat pump, again, like a lot of the words that I mentioned earlier, feels very conceptual and doesn't, a, a, a human can't like immediately know what that means. And then the assumption is that it's only for heating, so you still need air conditioning, when in fact it replaces both systems. Um, and, but we have this phrase of potential energy that when you're explaining, you're losing. So like that was a lot of steps to take someone through. Uh, so we're trying to figure out like what is that crisp way that we can communicate heat pumps um, and make it effective. So um, I'll, come back. I'll come back next year and talk to you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I have two questions. One is, have you done any testing on whether um, the word sustainable or sustainability, how that resonates with people? It is not quite as polarizing as green. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a broader coalition of people who support 
sustainability. I think it depends on how it's contextualized. Okay. Um, I will say we have seen a significant amount of backlash on the ESG movement. Um, and so I would try to stay away from, from ESG as a framing um, and instead think about like responsible business and, and things like that. But sustainability as a phrase, I think it's really context dependent in terms of how we can go. Thank you. Sure. My other question is um, with regards to my work, I work with environmental justice communities in Boston and we've done a number of presentations to residents about climate change and how it's impacting our neighborhoods and our communities. And typically those presentations have started off with kind of a briefer on what is climate change because we can't assume that everyone really understands it. Um, and I appreciate the suggestions you shared here and we'll definitely check out the full um, report. But I'm thinking about, like we have definitely tried to make those concepts of climate change or fossil fuels like more digestible for people who, like you said, don't really know the technicalities or really have that full understanding of what that language means. But I'm, I'm kind of struggling because I feel like those are still important things for us to communicate to residents. And I was just wondering if you had any suggestions with regards to explaining those important topics in ways that still are accurate and don't like make people feel like we're talking to them like they're children. Um, you know, like how can we still communicate those concepts to people who we want to understand what climate change is in, in effective ways? I think that depends. If you have a captive audience who is there to be educated, then I think a lot of the content Dr. Das covered this morning, in fact, is super helpful, right? So you can talk about, hey, you can see the curve of the Earth's surface temperature rising, and you can independently verify the CO2 um, content in the atmosphere and see that they pretty much like track to each other. Um, and that I think is quite powerful. You can show the fossil fuels versus renewables, which I actually really, really loves the way it was presented today, because you put them side by side and it's like, yeah, we're doing great. And then you see just how tiny that even at the um, highest level uh, it is. And so I think some of, the, some of those frames can be helpful. If you have, again, a captive audience who is looking to be educated, um, you don't need to shy away from it. And then um, explaining why 1.5 degrees is such a big deal, again, if you have a captive audience who's wanting to be educated. Otherwise, we really advise to focus on like the human side of it mm -hmm. um, and the impacts, the severe storms that I mentioned, statistic earlier, right? Like showing like, hey, in our community, and you can find what's the most relevant severe weather event for your community. Dr. Das talked about flooding for the state of Massachusetts. Um, depending on where you live, that might be a more relevant metric than severe storms if you're someone who lives in Florida. Thank you. Cheers. Um, and then I think, yeah, we're, yeah, we'll take this, well, it's the last person, so we'll, can we take it? Is that okay? Okay. okay I'll talk really All right, and then we will wrap. <laughs> so like you were just saying, we know about the comparison between renewables and fossil fuels, and one of the big things we all need to do and our communities need to do is reduce the amount of energy we use, whether that's biking and walking, instead of driving, even if it's electric, making buildings that are more efficient. What are what's some of the language you use around encouraging people to reduce in their um, in their lives and in their businesses? I'll be honest, we don't do a ton of work in the individual action space. We focus a lot more on collective action. So I don't I don't have an answer um, to that specific question, unfortunately. <laughs> Maybe um, next year. Maybe it's I do. I do think it's. I mean, you bring up you bring up a really important point, which is our systems have been developed with a car dependency um, that is very unique to the U.S. as far as developed countries go. Um, and so, but I do think that there's a lot of policy that can be done to encourage the types of infrastructure that then result in people taking the types of actions that we want them to take. So, what I mean by that is. If we just, I used to live in Houston, Texas, which is one of the most car dependent cities in the country. Um, every time we looked at building public transport infrastructure, the oil lobby, which of course is very strong in Houston, would block it. And instead we end up with highways that have 20 lanes. Um, what we need to do is enact policies that in lieu of building the 20 lane or continuing to add lanes to the highway, we actually do build that public transport system that actually gives people the option to do it. 
Um, bike lane infrastructure is another one, right? Lots of cities and towns around, around the country don't have bike lane infrastructure. And without it, cyclists are not going to feel safe being on the road next to a truck going 60 miles an hour, right? And so I really think a lot of the policy is required in order to get the behavior change to take place. Um, and that's, that's kind of like why we focus at that level. Um, as opposed to focusing at the individual level. Um, and then the last thing on that, I think it's all of you in your communities, you can do a lot of the work to encourage one-to-one -one, um, action and individual action. Um, but for for us from like a marketing lens or, or a communications lens, it's a lot more expensive to, to try to change, you know, 7 billion individual minds versus try to change what the policies are doing at the top that then encourage and flow through. So that's kind of, that's where we've decided to focus. I know um, our friends at Rare actually focus a lot on individual action. So um, our CEO is on their board as well. So um, they might be a better uh, person to talk to. All right, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Enjoy lunch.